So hello, welcome to another physics class. Today we're going to start chapter six, which is called momentum. Um, not going to lie, I think it's probably one of the simpler chapters, at least for doing problems wise, although the concepts can get a little complicated at times. Uh, but basically, we're going to talk about collisions. What happens when things ram into each other? And as a chapter called, just like last chapter called energy, we started with work and didn't talk about energy. This chapter about momentum, we're going to talk about something else to start. And what I want to, oops, what I want to start with is something called impulse. Anytime you do a force to a thing, good English though, anytime force is acted on an object, impulse is the force applied times the time that force is applied. Now of note that makes its units newton seconds and also is a vector quantity where the direction of impulse is the same as the direction of the force. Um, really, this should be an integral. Impulse should be the integral of force dt. But once again, we're doing this without calculus. Um, it's basically, yeah, how hard of a force did you do and how long did you do that force. Keep in mind, work is a force is the force times the distance you applied it. Impulse is the force times the time you implied it. But the general idea is that this is a vector, that if you push to the left, impulse is to the left, and so on. Make sense? This equation's not 100% correct. As I said, though, really, you need calculus. Uh, really, that equation as is would be average impulse will be the average force over time. Normally, if you push something, what happens is that you don't just go and like go straight from on off. Normally, when you go to push something, you start touching it, push harder and harder and harder, and then let off again. But if you look at force as a function of time, it would probably be the curve to the left. Um, of note, impulse should be the average, the area under that curve. But once again, we're just going to do the impulse as the average force over time. That really, I could say it's average force. Where a line over something means average. Um, but if you know the average force over the time period, that will give you the impulse. At least that's what we're going to have to deal with out calculus. Any questions? No questions? OK. So means that if you want to apply an impulse to something, I haven't really said what impulse is now that I look at it. I just said it's first times time. Um, yeah, I didn't say it at all. But basic general idea is the more impulse you apply, the faster something is going to go. If you want to make something move, you apply a force. By applying a force, you apply an impulse. The bigger the impulse, the faster the thing will go. Which means if you think that the force is there for a longer period of time, will in nature make things go, go faster, easier. So these two gifts, I have a tennis racket and a golf ball. A golf ball, you make it go really fast by applying a lot of force in a very little time period. This would be the same as A in the, on the graph, that if you look at this golf club hitting the golf ball, the golf ball only touches the club for a short period of time. All of the force is applied there. You apply an impulse by doing a lot of force in a very short time period. But something like a tennis racket, which can bend and whoop, that the process of bending, it touches the ball for a longer period. That instead of just going boop and bopping it, with something with netting, it'll cradle it, hold, and push. It'll leave contact for a longer period. It means you need less force to have as big of an impulse. To get this idea across, what I have here is I'm applying, I am going to apply a force with this tennis racket. The tennis racket, because it has netting, will once again cradle the ball and touch it longer. And then I'll apply the same force with a ping pong paddle. As I just bounce this with the tennis racket, I can get the ball pretty high pretty easily. But when I switch to the ping pong paddle, if I hit it the same amount of strength, the same force, it doesn't go nearly as high. It doesn't go as high because it didn't have as much initial velocity, so it didn't make it up as high. But what is happening is just because the solid wooden paddle is just on off, hits, let's go. 
while the tennis racket will cradle the ball, touch it longer, causing a larger impulse. Make sense? Now, our goal really isn't to talk about impulse, it's to talk about momentum. And we'll come back to impulse in two slides. But let's talk about momentum real fast instead. The linear momentum of a thing, which uses the symbol P. Um, why momentum uses a P? I mean, mass is already M, and capital M has other meanings. We're kind of running out of terms. Fuck it, P, why not? But linear momentum, which is P, is the mass times velocity of an object. It'll have units of kilogram meters per second. And it's a fancy way of saying how hard it is to stop the thing moving. Keep in mind, mass is impulse. Oh, sorry, mass is inertia. I misspoke. That was real bad. Mass is inertia. It's how hard it is to change something's velocity. And V is how what its velocity is. Momentum will just be how much effort it takes to bring something to a stop, where it would not only be how fast it's moving, but how heavy. This is the difference if I if I throw a baseball at you, let's say I'm like throw a baseball at you at like 60 miles per hour, which is pretty reasonable. It does, you can catch it without too much effort. A truck hits you at 60 miles per hour, you're pretty screwed. That's the difference. It's the difference of mass. That what is happening is that it had incorporated for how much inertia you have to overcome. And these ideas, impulse and momentum, are related in something called the impulse momentum theory which we can actually derive pretty easily. See, Newton's second law is just F equals ma. But we know acceleration, at least average acceleration, is change in velocity over change in time. Where change in velocity is just V final minus V initial. Well, if I take this equation, and if I multiply both sides by T, what I'll get is that first times time is change is MV final minus MV initial. But first times time, that was impulse, which means impulse is MV final minus MV initial. But MV, we just said, I just hit this thing, we just said was momentum. And what this says is impulse is change in momentum. What this means is anytime you want to change something's velocity, how much impulse you would need to apply would just be the change in momentum. That and if you want to change something the velocity, you can change how to do it. You can either apply a lot of force in a short time period or a long time period with a small amount of force or somewhere in between, right? If you're, travel if you're driving your car at 60 miles per hour and want to stop, you could slam on the brakes and do it quickly, or you can put the brakes slowly and slowly come to a stop. One will be a lot of force and real jerk. One will take a long period. That's just because the exact amount of impulse is always needed. That if you're going at some speed and want to go to rest, the impulse required, if you're going to rest, V final will be zero, will just be negative V initial. This is why on um, highways, they always have these barrels of water near where the intersection is, as you can see this car just smacked into. And it looks pretty bad, but if that wasn't there, it would be worse. The reason we use rain barrels like that when you at the side of a highway is because if we increase the time of the collision, you decrease the force. That if you stop your truck by going through the barrels or a barrel of hay is like my left picture. And if stopping takes longer, there's less force. As opposed, if you just hit the cement barrier, the collision would take less time. If the collision takes less time, it would involve more force. And force is bad for people. Same idea that if you decide to jump off a cliff onto the ground, you're pretty screwed. Because if you jump off a cliff onto like cement, the time that you're going to go to stop from your falling speed to not moving is just going to be in the time it takes you to meet the concrete. Concrete doesn't give much. It will be a very, very small amount of time. Therefore, it will be a very large force. But if you jump off a cliff of the same height into water, there's a good chance you'll be fine. The reason why is because it won't be the instant you hit the water that you have a force. It will be as you go into the water. You will extend the time period. And if you extend the time period, you would decrease the force. That being said, if you go high enough and land in water, it's still pretty lethal. Um, the reason why has to do with um, 
really the viscosity of water that if you hit it fast enough, it won't have time to flow and it will act like a solid surface and it will still just be the time period of just when you hit first the surface, just because of water's chemical makeup. And so, yeah, if you're going to fall off something high, you want to land on something that gives. This is why, like, in like old cartoons, they had like people running with big trampolines for the fire department and someone to jump out a window, which I don't know if they, I guess they really did in real life, but I only know it from old cartoons. It's because if you jump and land on a trampoline, it gives. It elongates the time of you stopping. By de increasing the time, it decreases the force. That if I take these Legos, what I did with these Legos is I made a very easily breakable thing. If I drop it from this height, it'll have a set velocity when it hits the table, table. The impulse is going to involve a very large force, though, because there's a very small amount of time it hits the table. But if I drop it into the water, it doesn't break. It doesn't break because it has a longer time period to slow down. Because as it goes down, it, let's see if I can pause it, it doesn't just hit the top of the water and instantly stop. It descends down into the water. That's the idea, impulse. You jump from something very high, you want to land on something soft. That being said, I do need to reference Assassin's Creed. Um, Pyre of Hay is not good enough. Every Assassin's Creed assassin is dead multiple times over. This just doesn't work. It's still not long enough time. Almost all things in car safety are based around this fact. Um, Cars are made to crumple. The reason why is in the gift down to the bottom. Cars crumple because if a car was solid and just hit the wall and bounced off, there'd be a very small time period for the car to stop. It would be more force on you. Cars crumple and crush because by cr crumpling and crushing, it increases the time of the collision. And if you increase the time of the collision, it is less force on you. An airbag, that without an airbag, if you hit the solid you see, it will just boom to the side of your head. But if you hit a large pillow that you can pound into and push off, it increases the time of a collision. Seat belts, they keep you from flying, but they're also ever so slightly stretchy. It doesn't seem like they are because it's barely, but they do a little bit. And so a seat belt doesn't just get against you, it'll cradle, give a little bit and pull back. Um, I'm not gonna bother playing this video. I think I just said everything in it, but you can watch it on your own if you want. But that's the general idea of all car safety things. It is to increase the time of your collision. Because if you're traveling at a set speed, you need a set impulse to stop you. If you increase the time of the collision, you decrease the force. Yeah, what the hell, I'll play the video. I said I wasn't going to, I'm gonna do it anyways. I have time. Approximately 56 megajoules of chemical energy per liter. Cars. I get that they actually start at the beginning though. Gasoline has approximately 56 megajoules of chemical energy per liter, which is more energy than you get from exploding the same amount of TNT and is enough to power a toaster for a full day. Cars work by burning gasoline to convert that chemical energy into the kinetic energy of motion of the car, though almost 80% of it is lost as heat in the engine. Still, 20% of 56 million joules is a lot of joules. To give a direct sense of gas to car conversion, it takes about 5 teaspoons of gas to accelerate a 2 ton car to 60 kilometers per hour, and about a third of a cup more for every additional minute you want to keep it going at that speed. That might not sound like a lot of fuel, but the energy of a car moving 60 kilometers per hour is equivalent to dropping an elephant, or stegosaurus, from the top of a three-story building. And in order for the car to stop, all that energy has to go somewhere. If the brakes do the stopping, they dissipate the energy by heating up. Or in the case of a collision, energy is dissipated by the bending and crumpling of metal in the outer areas of the car. And just like how smooth braking is nicer than a quick jerky stop, cars are carefully designed to crumple when they crash in a way that lengthens the duration of the impact so that stopping requires less intense acceleration. Lots of acceleration over a very short time is not good for soft human brains and organs. However, people don't like driving cars with Pinocchio-length noses, so most cars only have around 50 centimeters of crushable space in which to dissipate the energy equivalent of our falling stegosaur. That means that while crumpling, they need to maintain a resistive force of about a quarter of the thrust of the space shuttle main engine. Over half of the controlled crumpling work is done by a pair of steel rails connecting the front bumper to the body, which bend and deform to absorb energy and slow the car. 
Most, and in ideal circumstances, all of the rest of the energy is absorbed by the deformation of other pieces of structural metal throughout the front of the car. This meticulously engineered destruction allows a crashing car to decelerate at a high, but reasonable and constant rate, just slightly over the acceleration experienced by fighter pilots or astronauts in centrifuge training. As comparison, if cars were super rigid, like they were before the 1950s, and didn't crumple, they would stop so fast that they would undergo acceleration 15 times what fighter pilots experience in training, which is definitely not good for your internal organs. Thankfully, engineers have learned to make cars with crunchy crumple zones surrounding a rigid safety cell, because fully rigid cars are not good for fighter pilots or anyone else. Except maybe robots. This minute physics video. So there's the general idea. Okay. Let's do an example problem. In a crash test, a car of a mass 1,500 kilograms collides with a wall and rebounds, as in the figure. The initial and final velocity of the cars are negative 15 and 2.6 meters per second, respectively. So I'm saying the initial is negative 15, the final is 2.6. And you can see I'm saying the car is moving to the right, or sorry, moving to the left, hitting the wall and bouncing back a little bit. And that's what I got, just boom. I hit my ring again. Ah, it really hurts when I punch my ring. But it's slamming into the wall, and after slamming the wall, kind of bouncing away from it. If the collision lasted for 0.15 seconds, what is the impulse delivered on the call and the size and direction of the force? See, if I want to solve for this, I'll say I know the mass. And I know that the call started at negative 15. And after the collision is coming back from the wall at 2.6. And it does this in 0.15 seconds. Impulse has two equations. One is force times time. The other one, though, is change in momentum. And if I look at this, I don't know the force. So I'm going to use the change in momentum equation. I'll just say impulse is final momentum minus initial momentum. And so the impulse, the final momentum, or final velocity was 2.6. The initial mo velocity was negative 15. And I'll just say it's m times v final minus m times v initial which will give me a value of the impulse. That is how much impulse the call will need to stop. How much force it needs though? Force, so we're just gonna go, oh, sorry. For the record, I got a positive answer. Positive answer means to the right. This is all vectors. Just like in chapter four, we're dealing with vectors again. Be careful about that. Impulse is a vector and so is force and so is momentum. The car was moving to the left and afterwards was moving to the right. That means the direction must be to the right, which we also know because we got a positive answer. If I got a negative answer, it would be to the left. But if I want to find the force, I also know impulse is force times time, which means if I divide both sides by time, the force is the impulse over the time period to which I can plug in values and solve. Now, this is also a positive answer. So this is also to the right. Questions? OK. This next problem is another impulse problem. I did not write this problem. This is from a, the textbook I used to use. And the book's phrasing is so goddamn weird and stupid. I like to do the problem and just be like, who the hell writes this shit? I had a Here's... question about that last one. Yeah, sure. That was the average force? That's the average force, yep. OK. As I said, to do instantaneous, you need to use calculus. OK. It would be the, um, to get force, it would be the derivative of impulse with respect to time to do instantaneous, but we'll just do average. OK. And that's average because it was the change in time over the like the whole time period. It wasn't a fraction of the time, correct? Yeah, it's because, so when the car hits and it crumples, right? When it first touches, there'll be very little force because it's just starting. And then as it crumples, the force will change. And then as the car bounces back, it won't fully reshape on the way back, obviously, but it will reshape a little bit. Now, when it comes back, it'll go from, Zero force. It's not like 
zero force, all the force, zero force again. You go zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, you know, up to 1.76 times 10 to the fifth and even higher, and then back down to zero as it pulls away. The force would be a nice bell curve. Okay. Okay, so weird for a Superman problem. This is a little complicated of a problem, but I kind of like it still. Once again, did not write any of this. Superman leaps in front of Lois Lane to save her from a volley of bullets. In a one minute interval, an automatic weapon fires 150 bullets, each of mass eight grams at 400 meters per second. The bullets strike his mighty chest, which has an area of 0.75 meters squared. Like seriously, really? Find the average force exerted on Superman's chest if the bullets bounce back after an elastic head-on collision. Now, I haven't talked about what elastic means yet. We're going to come back to that. But elastic collision means that the bullets are going to bounce back, in this case, the same velocity they hit him at. And so what I'm going to say is that in 60 seconds, there's 150 bullets. And if Superman does not budge, if he's not getting pushed backwards, which we can assume he's not going to get pushed backwards, he's Superman. Once again, I would never have you do this problem because I make a bunch of assumptions here. Is that the initial velocity of the bullets would just be negative the final velocity. That if they come in at 400 meters per second, they'll come off him at negative 400 meters per second. That V initial would just be negative V final because they're coming in and bouncing straight back off. Well, each bullet has a mass of 0 0.008 kilograms. What I can say is impulse is change in momentum. And so the impulse of one bullet would be MV final minus MV initial. Now, keep in mind, V final is just negative V initial. And I can plug that in. If it's, I can say V final equals negative MV, sorry, V final equals negative V initial. And I can get that is actually negative 2mv initial, just because of the um, because of this fact right here, which I can use to plug in my number and say that one bullet would have an impulse of negative 6.4 kilograms per meter squared. It's negative because it's to the left. They're pushing them this way. But that's just one bullet. What I said is that in 60 seconds, there's 150 bullets. And the total impulse would just be the sum of the impulses. So I'm just going to take that number and multiply by 150. If I multiply by 150, I'll get the value for all the bullets combined, which goes from 6.4 to 960. And if I want to know the force exerted by Superman's mighty chest, matching the phrasing still, impulse is force times time which means the average force would just be the impulse over time, which I said 60 seconds, so I can solve. Negative to, to the left. Any questions though? Now, just like last chapter, I started with work and then I never really dealt with work. We want to do conservation of energy. I'm going to do the same kind of idea here. Now, what I want to talk about is what happens when there's no external forces. What happens when things collide? See, I can say here these bullets are bouncing off Superman, but what does that do to Superman? Shouldn't that push him back somewhat? And let's talk about an example. Let's say I have two people on ice skates that are touching hands. And they're going to push off each other. And they each have different masses. Oh, let's not do that yet. Nope, 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 not that. Uh, here we go. So I have these two coats. They, are, they start stuck together. And when I hit the button, they push off each other. They have the both mass and they both kind of fly at the same speed. But let's see, what I, if I make one coat a lot heavier, like this one on the left and hit this, they'll fly off at different speeds. The blue coal, which is lighter, does not move as fast as the red coal. But we know Newton's third law, that the force from the blue coal acting on the red equals the force of the red acting on the blue. And if we assume no external forces, AKA no one jumps it, no third person jumps in and tackles this all, 
that in my GIF, I don't blip the table while doing it. What I can say is that the impulse people feel will equal the change in momentum. That for person one, they will feel a force from person two, being to their change in momentum. Note that I have two subscripts here. Velocity on person one, final. Velocity on person one, initial. We're going to have a shit ton of subscripts this chapter. Be careful with it. We're going to have a lot of subscripts. Meanwhile, though, person two will also feel an impulse. Will be the first on person two from one, and they'll have their own change in momentum. Their mass times their change in velocity. But Newton's third law said that the first person one feels is the same as the first person two feels, just in opposite direction. Which means I can set these two equations equal with a negative sign. What I'm going to do is I will factor out my masses and rearrange. And this leaves me with this equation here. That M1V1 initial plus M2V2 initial equals M1V1 final plus M2V2 final. What this says is the initial momentum of person one plus the initial momentum of person two equals the final momentum of person one plus the final momentum of person two. The short version is if there is no external forces, if no one just jumps in from the side and whacks someone with a hockey stick, they're on skates, it makes sense at the time that momentum is conserved in any collision. It does not matter what energy is doing. And in fact, in a collision, ignore energy. Going back to the call video we watched, it talked about how energy is dissipated in the collision. But no matter how much energy is dissipated in any collision, momentum is conserved. The initial momentum equals the final momentum. And that when I have these guys shoot off apart from each other, I can say initial momentum equals final momentum. If I instead have two cars that come flying in and bounce off each other like this, I can say initial momentum equals final momentum. If I instead have them two things that weigh very differently, initial momentum equals final momentum. If they go and stick together, initial momentum equals final momentum. Anytime other things meet, initial momentum will equal final momentum. That is the law of conservation of momentum. If there are no external forces, once again, that in this gif here, if that third guy sitting down doesn't throw something into the mix, when these two people run forward, they each have momentum. After they collide, they both have momentum. This girl who looks like she just gets destroyed here doesn't weigh as much as the guy, so she doesn't have the same velocity. But momentum is conserved. And anytime two things collide, M1V1 initial plus M2V2 initial, we equal M1V1 final plus M2V2 final. If you have three objects, you just have three of them, M1V1, M2V2, M3V3, and so on. But the total initial momentum equals the total final momentum. And that is true in all of this GIF. That's true in all of these videos I played. That I can say the moment, uh, I don't want that one. Bounce. I can say that the momentum of this blue car initial plus the momentum of this red car initial equals the momentum of the blue car final plus the momentum of the red car final. Do keep in mind, though, momentum is a vector, which means I'll say initially this blue car has a positive initial velocity. Initially, this red car has a negative initial velocity. I'm still going to do everything to the right as positive, everything to the left is negative. After the collision, after the collision, the blue car has a negative velocity. The red car has a positive velocity. Because the red car after the is moving to the right, the blue car is moving to the left. You must watch your signs while doing this. OK? Now, in a collision, we're going to do one dimension right now. Just like how we did kinematics, we started with 1D and we eventually went to 2D. With projectile motion, we'll do the same idea. We'll get to 2D on Wednesday. But just looking at a 1D collision, when things come up, bounce and hit each other. There are three different type of collisions that are possible. One is an elastic collision. 
Elastic collision means that there was no change in kinetic energy. That not only is momentum conserved, but momentum is always conserved. No matter what, momentum is conserved. But also there's no change in kinetic energy. That the initial kinetic energy of the system equals the final kinetic energy of the system. This only happens when you have objects that do not change shape. These coats actually have elastic collisions because it's kind of hard to tell when I play this full speed, but they don't ever actually touch. Um, so they have magnets. And so when they get close, the ma So when they get close, instead of touching, the magnets just push off each other and like go and like get and push off. You can't tell, but these are magnets that are pushing off each other. I can't push them closer. And so they don't actually touch. So they're elastic collisions. But an elastic collision means any time energy is conserved. For the most part, though, the things have to have no change in shape. That if I go and have like this collide with something and it kind of gets compressed, that'll definitely be, that would not be an elastic collision. Anytime there's change in shape, it is not elastic. There's also inelastic collisions. Inelastic collisions is there is a change in shape. Two cars hit it, each other, that is an inelastic collision because they will crumple. That some energy is lost to heat. However, even if they crumple, momentum is conserved. Momentum is always conserved. So I can set, use conservation of momentum still. And so this, to be fair, I said it's elastic collision. It's probably not perfectly elastic. There's probably a tiny bit of energy lost. But either way, I can use the same conservation of energy. The third type of collision is when things do not bounce. This is the third type of collision, that when I slide these things and they stick together, or even if they have the exact same mass and I slide and they stick together and don't move after. Like both these have a set velocity and they collide and afterwards have no velocity. I can still use conservation of energy. That is called a completely inelastic collision. So once again, elastic just means energy is not conserved. Completely inelastic means that they are stuck together. This is completely inelastic. But in a completely inelastic collision, momentum is still conserved. I will still say initial momentum equals final momentum. In this case, what it would be is that both cults had about the same value of momentum or same magnitude because they were moving at the same velocity and had the same mass. But one was positive and one was negative. The blue call was positive because it was traveling to the right. The red call was negative because it was traveling to the left. And if I add the same number positive and negative together, I get zero. They come to rest because of conservation of momentum. Now, these three different types of equations, momentum is conserved. It doesn't make its difference in how you solve them. You solve them all the same. You just say initial momentum equals final momentum and solve. The only real change is that if you happen to have an elastic um, collision, the Newton's ladder is an example of something with an elastic collision. You can also use energy, mechanical energy is conserved. But other than that, otherwise you can always use conservation of energy. Questions? Okay, when solving these problems, there's a few things you gotta keep track of. The first off is I really, really, really recommend figures. And I often give figures on exams and homework. When you do a conservation momentum problem, it's always good to have a before and after sketch. I recommend labeling each thing. And I said, if I give you the figure, you can use that. Because if I look at a collision with two things coming in and bouncing off each other, that figure right there is basically this. That's what I'm looking at in this picture. I have two things coming in with about the same velocity, and they bounce off with that blue one traveling a bit faster. I really wish this didn't auto resize when it looped. I gotta see if I can find a setting where it doesn't do that. That is the same thing as this figure. All it is is I would say that initially the blue car has momentum. Final, the blue car has momentum. Initially, the red car has momentum. Final, the red car has momentum. And I'll just label them. 
I have blue is one, red is two. So I have V1 initial, V2 initial, V1 final, V2 final. And I really recommend drawing arrows to represent all the things. Keep track of your subscripts. You're going to have a lot of subscripts here. And just show what it is before, what it is after. I will say if it's completely inelastic, there's actually two types of completely inelastic. There's they start apart and show up together. And there's another one that doesn't really have a title. But if they start together and break apart, um, here they start together and come apart. I can basically treat that the same as a completely inelastic problem. If they end up together or start together, I could go and just say one final velocity in the case of them sticking together. Instead of saying V1 final and V2 final, I can just say V final because the completely inelastic collision, once they stick together, they both will have the same velocity. That went completely inelastic. That when these guys come together, they both have the same final velocity. They both have the same final velocity because they are stuck together. And so I don't have to say V1 final, V2 final. I can just say V final. Wait, so um, when you're talking about degree of elasticity, does it change the way that you solve the problem at all? Nope. Or just? Not at okay. all. Okay. 100% the same. Now, this idea of kind of the opposite completely elastic equation, when these things will uh, recoil, when they were starting together and pushing apart, that is once again also conservation of momentum. This idea where they are stationary and they push off each other, this is commonly called the recoil problem. And I'm not a big gun person in general, but I keep doing physics with guns because, well, it kind of is one of the better ways to show it. But when you shoot a gun, the gun has a recoil. It pushes back. The reason why is conservation of momentum. So this picture in the below, I have a cannon and a cannonball, where M sub C is the cannon, M sub B is the cannonball. Let's say initially the cannon is at rest, and it fires the cannonball. What's going to happen is the cannon will move backwards, just like this. And see, the reason I can say that is conservation momentum. Initial momentum equals final momentum. But if initially, if initially it's at rest, I can say my initial momentum is zero because my initial velocity is zero. That the velocity of the cannon initial is zero. The velocity of the cannon ball is zero. And so my initial momentum is zero. After it fires, what's going to happen is the cannon ball is going to be given velocity. But if the cannon ball is given velocity, the cannon will also get velocity because after it fires, they both will have momentum. The momentum of the cannon final plus the momentum of the ball final. And since initial momentum equals final momentum, I'll say that this final momentum must equal zero. It equals zero because that is the initial momentum. And if I go and subtract the momentum of the ball from both sides, and divide both sides by the mass of the cannon, I get this equation. That when the cannon launches the cannonball, the cannon gets a velocity. Negative, because it's in the opposite direction of the velocity of the ball, mass of the ball, velocity of the ball over the mass of the cannon. Anytime you are launching something, this happens. That even if you're just playing tennis and whacking something with a racket, there will be some, you won't be swinging as fast after you hit the ball, because there's some pushback. And if you want to launch something to go really heavy, really fast, like go full on artillery, it's something that needs to be planned for. Very, very large cannons like this are made so that they are, can be built to go backwards. This has scoops as feet to grab the dirt and slow it down. And you can see the whole barrel shoots backwards as it fires. Basically, this is going to happen. And if you do not build something to account for this recoil, it will break itself because it's going to happen. You cannot stop it. Do not try. Any questions? OK. I'm going to do some actually more complicated conservation momentum problems. I am not going to do really any with recoil after this. Um, recoil is kind of the simple idea. 
Um, but I'm going to go through some problems. I'm not going to do all the problems today. I'm probably going to do one today, and I'll do a lot more Wednesday, and then we'll go 2D on Wednesday. And the first problem I want to do is something that's a little more complicated than something I would ever ask you to do. And it's something called a ballistic pendulum. A ballistic pendulum is a real thing with a real use to measure the muzzle velocity of, some, of any type of ballistic. This is what a ballistic pendulum is. You take whatever is doing the launching and you have it shoot the thing into something that can catch it. And you, you set it up so you can measure how high up it goes. Right here, I have a little protractor. This is at zero degrees. And when I fire this, it catches the ball. And when it fires, it caused this guy to swing upwards. Now, because of where this is, I can't see what angle it's at. Oh, now I just, now my hand's in the way. I know I did that. But whatever angle it goes up to, this little black piece will go up to that angle. Right now it's at about 55 degrees because I lifted it up that high. And so what happens when it fires, I can measure exactly what angle it goes to. This was at about 18 degrees. And if I know what angle this goes to, I can figure out exactly the muzzle velocity of this launch hole. How fast was it moving in meters per second before it went up? Because what's going to happen is the ball will have some initial momentum. The ball will hit this, and once the ball hits this piece, this whole piece will move upwards. It'll move upwards because it had velocity, because it had a conservation of momentum. So let's solve a problem with this. Let's say I have a ballistic pendulum that's just firing a bullet into a block of wood. A bullet is fired into a large block of wood suspended from light wires. The bullet is stopped by the block. The entire system swings up to a height h. It's possible, um, let's say the mass of the bullet is five grams. The mass of the block of wood, m2, is one kilogram. And it slides upwards five centimeters. What is the initial speed of the bullet? What I can say is, well, let's do this conversion. Five grams, put that to kilograms. Five centimeters, we'll put it to meters. What I can say is this bullet, before it hits the block, before the, the bullet hits the block, the bullet has some velocity. The bullet has some velo velocity, so it has some momentum. Once it hits the block, it puts itself in the block. What that means is it's going to be part of the block. That means this is a completely inelastic collision. And after the collision, we'll also have momentum. I can say that when the bullet hits the block, momentum is conserved. Now, this is just for the part when it goes from, go back further, from there to not even heal, from there to heal. This is now the ball is in there because you can see it's yellow now. But that's as far as we're going to get, just to this spot. This sliding up is a whole other problem. But before it slides up, I can do conservation momentum from this spot to this spot between those frames. Because I'll just say initial momentum equals final momentum. Well, momentum is mv. Now, initially, the block wasn't moving. That means v2 initial is 0, because it wasn't moving. And v final? The bullet and the block, it's completely inelastic. They're stuck together. So they have the same V final. So instead of V1 final, V2 final, I'll just call it V final, which would let me factor out an M. And if I divide, if I want to know the velocity of the bullet, I can divide both sides by the mass of the bullet. And if I plug in some numbers, I can get an equation for the velocity of the bullet. But I can only get if I know the velocity of the block afterwards. But let's look at the velocity of this block. What I can say is from this moment, right when the bullet hits it, to when it slides upwards, which it doesn't go up very high, so let me do when I just mess with it instead. Come on. Really? So I can do from when it first hits it to when it I'm just doing like it slides upwards. What that is is something changing height. By changing height, what I get, and here's me actually trying to show this for when I'm not doing it in person. When it's changing height, what happens is by changing height, it's also slowing down. That's conservation of energy. That has not the collision. That's just something swinging upwards. I can say energy is conserved not during the collision, but just from something going woo up. 
because it's going up. And if it's going up, it's slowing down. Well, initial energy equals final energy. And I'm going to redefine my initials in a weird way. My initial in this case, my initial in this case isn't what I called initial over here. It's this V final. That my V final before, that's when the box block slot starts sliding up. So I'll say the initial energy is one half m1 plus m2 v final squared, because that's the energy right when the block gets hit. And that moves upwards a height h. That means it gains potential energy. And at its highest point would have no kinetic energy. I can cancel out the masses, multiply both sides by 2, and square root. And this will tell me the velocity of the block right after it is um, the bullet goes into it. And if I know the velocity of the block right after the bullet goes into it, I can plug that in over here. Plugging that in over there will give me a value. Didn't you just solve for the velocity at the highest point? Velocity at the highest point is zero. That's what I was thinking, but why'd you plug in the height? When Did you plug in your highest point as the height? Yep, I did. And wouldn't, then wouldn't that mean the velocity should be zero? The velocity was zero at the highest point. Oh, I see. I, I see. I got you. Because yep. right, kinetic energy is zero. Right. The, the final velocity is what you're solving for. That's different from what you plugged in. Yes. Because I, I, I changed, because for the first bit, I'm saying... I'm saying for the for, for the left side of this page, I was going from here to yeah there, and that's why I said final. For the second bit, I'm going from here, so the ball is already in there, to when it's up high. This thing doesn't go very high in real life. Okay. And that's how they work. This is a real thing, as I said, that is used. Now, this is a slightly more complicated problem than something I'd give. I'm using conservation energy and conservation momentum. Uh, four minutes. And I would right now do a more traditional problem, the type of thing you expect on homework and exams, but four minutes might be a little tight to do it. So I might just put it off till Wednesday. And on Wednesday, show you problems like you can expect on exams and homework. Yeah, I'm going to stop there because I don't want to start a problem and not finish it over and over. But I will pick one up on Wednesday where you'll see the type of thing I actually expect you to be able to do. Where we'll start with Mario sacrificing Yoshi to his death. Because, you know, that's a fun thing to talk about. Um, unless there's any other questions, then we will stop there. And uh, have a good day. I'll see you all Wednesday.